So um, I'll explain uh, what I mean by universality in a, in a minute. And uh, let me first uh, tell you the point of view uh, that I'm coming from. As you know, I'm, I'm doing theoretical computer science and, and algorithms. So here's my uh, view on this. So in machine learning, there's data, of course. And by analogy, you know, we can think of it as raw materials for construction. Then there's a model, okay, where you specify what, did it, what it is you're trying to fit, right? What structure are you trying to find in the data? And you can think of that as an architectural plan, uh, which is what you're trying to do. And then there's a fitted model, which may look very different and, uh, or not. Maybe it looks exactly like what you intended it to look like. And then there's a model fitting algorithm which bridges these three, which takes you from data and the, and the model you have in mind to the fitted model. And, uh, and that's uh, typically based on non-convex optimization and it's actually solving problems in many cases which are technically NP-complete or NP-hard, uh, but in practice it works anyway. And I'm very interested in why that happens. And so the phenomenon that interests me as a theorist is there's no precise understanding in many of these settings why, when and why the model fitting works, when it's non-convex, and what properties the fitted model has. Okay, so, uh, so a, a, in contrast to architecture, you know, which after thousands of years of thinking about it now, we know that you know, when we have a plan, the final model will have some very identifiable properties, but that's not the case with machine learning yet, and, um, and I'll give you some examples. Okay, so the running theme in this talk Okay, and this is the, so I already explained machine learning and now I'm explaining universality. So the running theme in this talk is this uh, uh, phenomenon uh, my group has discovered in three settings that I'll describe in the last year, uh, where in the fitted model, right, so that's uh, building at the end, uh, the parameters, the numbers that occur in the model, behave like random numbers. And, um, and random numbers modulo, you know, whatever constraints they may have to satisfy by design, by the by architectural plan, right? So sometimes model parameters have to be, have to be non-negative or sparse, meaning uh, very few of them are non-zero. That's sparsity. So there might be some model constraints, but modulo that, they seem to be pretty random. Okay, so I call that universality. Uh, and um, this has implications, as we'll see, for the speed of algorithms and also provable algorithms. So you can design provable algorithms and implications for the properties of the fitted model. So we'll see examples of both. And as I said, universality refers to this phenomenon uh, that matrices in a host of settings in physics, math, et cetera, behave like generic random matrices. Um, I won't try to uh, define this more uh, precisely than that because anyway, I have no explanation for this phenomenon. I mean, why this happens? Presumably it happens because when you fit the model, you have this optimization, optimization algorithm which is taking this whole bunch of data and data has some random-like properties. It has some structure, but the rest is maybe random or random-like. And so when you aggregate all this data by some optimization, the model ends up being random. I don't know. I, I, I don't have a, beyond, beyond that I don't have an intuition. Um, and it'll probably take many decades to prove anything approaching that, I mean, based upon how difficult it is to talk about universality. So, okay, so that's it. So that's universality, and all we'll do is just uh, observe that in practice the model parameters behave like random numbers and what we can derive out of that, okay? I won't have, say, I won't have anything else profound to say about universality. Okay, so vignette one. So uh, there are three vignettes, uh, and the first one is gonna be provable and fast algorithms for inference and topic models. And this is some uh, work that's uh, appearing in the upcoming ICML here in New York next month uh, with Ronga, uh, Frederick Kohler, who's a Princeton undergrad actually, uh, Ankur Moitra, and Teng Yuma. So topic models are unsupervised methods, meaning they, are, they work without any human supervision or labeling, uh, to learn thematic structure of documents in a text corpus. So, and we'll be interested in one specific problem related to inference in topic models, so let me define them. Okay, so topic models. So the idea here is that you're trying to understand in a, some text corpus completely unlabeled with humans, let's say New York Times or, or journal articles or something, some text corpus, you're trying to understand the thematic structure, which means that you, you hypothesize that there are some topics 
Okay, so like New York Times articles may be about politics, food, sports, etc. And uh, we don't know these topics, okay? And uh, the algorithm discovers those. Um, and what is a topic? So uh, it, it, uh, this whole field uses the bag of words, a bag of words kind of uh, view of documents. So you ignore all the linguistic structure of documents and think of them as bag of words. How many times did walnut appear in a document? How many times did football occur in a document, et cetera, okay? So for all words in the dictionary, let's say about 100,000 words, 50,000 words, it tells you how many times each word occurs in a document, that vector, okay? So that's called the bag of words. So you've gotten rid of all linguistic structure, but turns out that just looking at which bag of words appears in the, topic, in the document, you can get a pretty good idea, right? And this is intuitively clear, right? Uh, whether it's about politics or or food, or sports, et cetera. Or maybe it's about the US elections, in which case it's about politics and sports, right? Uh, so, so, doc so documents may be a mixture of topics, OK? So a little bit about politics, a little bit about sports. And it's quantified as follows. So for instance, you might uh, have a document that's 0.7 about politics and 0.3 about sports, OK? And so what does that mean? So it means the following. So uh, it means that uh, the person who was generating, so it's a sort of very toy model of how documents are generated. Okay, Maybe it appeals to you if uh, you're a critic of the New York Times. But uh, the model is that you know, somebody randomly picked out these proportions, politics and sports, and uh, 0.7 politics, 0.3 sports. Now each of these politics, food, sports, et cetera, is some ground truth distribution of words that occur in the politics topic and in the sports topic. So each of these are distribution and these numbers in the columns sum up to one, both for politics and sports. So if you take 0.7 times this vector plus 0.3 that times that vector, you get another distribution of words. Okay, the column, the, the row entry is still sum to one. So that's your new distribution, 0.7 times the first and 0.3 times sports. That's your new distribution. And then just like monkeys typing on keyboards, you are just picking this, uh, this uh, person writing the document is picking out words according to the distribution. Okay, so let's say 300 words out of the distribution. That's how the document is generated, the bag of words corresponding to the document. Okay, so that's topic models. Uh, so yeah, the monkey is picking out this sparse. So it's sparse because you know, there might be a few hundred topics and presumably each document is only about four or six topics at most. So this vector is sparse. So the monkey picked out a sparse vector according to some distribution, computed eight times x, which is a new distribution on words, and sampled, say, 300 words from that distribution. OK? So this vector is very, very long, right? As long as a dictionary, and you got a very, very partial view. OK? Samples according to this distribution, IID samples. That's topic models. Uh, all right, so that's the. Uh, document, IID sample from the word distribution given by A times X. Now, in some prior work, uh, I mean, there, there are algorithms for uh, learning the topic models. Today, we are going to assume that the topic model has been learned. Okay, and we are interested in the, in the labeling problem, given a document, figure out what topics were in the document. Okay, we will not worry about how the topic model was learned. And we have some work, and there, there's a whole body of work there. But uh, just given a document, figure out these proportions, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, et cetera, OK? So that's the inference problem. So given a document y generated using unknown topic proportions x, infer x. OK, and now there's some, uh, you know, it's a Bayesian setting. Uh, x was itself, itself chosen from some distribution. Uh, it's a sparse vector. There'll be some uncertainty, but turns out that if, you, if the document is even reasonably large, say a few hundred for the typical parameters, x is, because x is sparse, it's pretty well determined. Okay, so you should be able to, in principle, uh, be able to recover x. Question is, can you do it efficiently? Now it turns out uh, it is NP hard, okay? If you allow the number of topics and words to go to infinity, this is NP hard, okay? It's a very difficult form of sparse regression. Okay, so as I said, this is kind of reminiscent of sparse regression where there's a known matrix A and the monkey picked out some x, and a times x plus noise, right? That's sparse regression. Here, it's a different model of noise, because uh, uh, 
again, you know, over here, if uh, the noise has mean zero, the expectation of the vector you're looking at is a times x, right? Um, here also, the expectation of the vector you're looking at is up to some scaling, a times x, because these are just IID samples from that distribution, a times x. But there's a new noise model, and it's, it has very high variance. Why? Because the number of words in the dictionary is like 100,000. Okay, so imagine a distribution which is uniform on 100,000 words, or fairly uniform. And then you're getting 300 coordinates out of it. So it's some random sample of like 300. That doesn't tell you what the other coordinates were. Okay, so it's, uh, it's very high noise. Okay, you can't treat it using regression. Okay, so, uh, so what we do uh, uh, in regression, you often define pseudo inverses. So um, we define a new pseudo inverse that's uh, inspired by some work in collaborative filtering by Kleinberg and Sandler. So A is this topic matrix, n by k, n is, as I said, number of words in the dictionary, 100,000, 50,000. K is the number of topics, a few hundred. Uh, y is a word vector for the document, say 300 non zeros, 300 words in the document. And X is unknown topic proportions. And we already said e expectation of Y is A times X, but variance is high. So the idea as in um, uh, regression is that you uh, think about pseudo inverses. So B is a left pseudo inverse if B times A is identity, okay, where K is the number of topics. So this always exists because, you know, under fairly general conditions. So now if you were to just apply B times Y, B to Y, so get B times Y and take the expectation, you get in the expectation B times A times X up to scaling, which is X, okay? But again, that doesn't solve. I mean, we don't know what the variance of this is, okay? So the variance could be high, and the variance depends upon the largest entry of B. At least that's the most trivial bound on the variance. There might be other better bounds. Okay? So does there exist a pseudo inverse B where B infinity is small? Okay, the largest entry in B. So that's it. So you'd be able to solve this topic inference problem fairly efficiently, you know, if you could find a pseudo inverse where the largest entry is small. Okay, and pseudo inverse is just this matrix so that B times A is identity. Okay, so, uh, so you can write down a linear program to compute such a pseudo inverse because you're just looking for a matrix which B times A is identity and it has a small uh, maximum va uh, largest value. So you write down a linear program here. Actually, I'm writing a linear program that's a little bit more general uh, where I'm each actually allowing some delta uh, jiggle in each coordinate even, which turns out actually improves the method a little bit. Okay, so if delta equals zero, turns out it corresponds to a, a, a condition number, but it's called the infinity to one condition number, okay, and it's the reciprocal of that, uh, which is this quantity, the max of, okay, this doesn't show over there. So the, the max of that, the, for uh, max over all vectors x, the largest coordinate of x divided by ax times one. Notice that x here is allowed to have negative coordinates, unlike the topic vector. Uh, all right. So if you've seen condition numbers, it's just one of these funny condition numbers. And it exactly captures that. Okay. Now this condition number, turns out, can be very large in general. But if you, think, if you start uh, playing with it, you uh, realize, you know, if you had sort of a random-like matrix. So what does that mean? The topic matrix has non-negative coordinates, but it's some matrix with random uh, non-negative coordinates. Then pretty, sure, pretty quickly you can convince yourself that, the, that this condition number will actually be pretty good for random matrices. In general, it can be very, very bad. Okay? And so that's the intuition. So we ran the linear program on the topic matrix, that, you know, several settings, as you'll see. And actually, it's fairly small. Okay? So, so I'll show the chart in, uh, in the next slide. So anyway, the theorem is that if this uh, condition number is small, then you can recover x with high probability using a fairly efficient algorithm, just the, the one I said, uh, using documents of size lambda square r square log k. Okay, now if this lambda were large, this would be too huge. Okay, you want to be able to do this inference using realistic document sizes, 300 words or something. Uh, 
So if lambda were large, this would be very bad news, but turns out lambda is actually small, as it would be for random matrices. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, some, so there are these three corpora, NIPS, Enron, and New York Times. These are standard corpora in, uh, uh, in topic modeling that people have studied. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the number of words, uh, number of topics in those topic models that people have fitted. And lambda, lambda could have been pretty bad, but it's actually just a small constant. Okay, and the version I showed where you allowed some jiggle room, actually that's a little bit improved, which actually makes a difference. You know, factor two means that you can infer X from a document that's uh, four times smaller, according to the theory. Okay, so, so that, jiggle, that the wiggle room actually helps. So, so that's just an example of what I was saying earlier that uh, this topic matrix, which a priori could be completely arbitrary, turns out to behave like a random matrix with respect to this condition number. And it allows this fast algorithm. Okay, and uh, this shows the, how well the recovery works. Firstly, the algorithm is very fast. It's just simple linear algebra. It's much faster than the Bayesian methods like Gibbs sampling that people use, number one. And number two, it's not only faster, but it's actually provable. You can prove that it works, okay? Because you can compute the condition number, and so you can prove that it works. And, uh, and this shows the error. So Gibbs sampling is, uh, as I said, the Bayesian standard. So that's very good. But our method, you know, th this is a slight tweak on the method I described, uh, actually approaches that. In the large document limit and the small document limit, it's just a little bit worse. So it's very, very fast. And it's almost as good as this Bayesian method, which is much slower. OK, so that was one example. Next example, neural nets. So this is an example of the second phenomenon I was talking about. Uh, the first phenomenon was that if the par parameters are random-like, then you can design fast algorithms. So that was the first vignette. Here uh, is illustrating the second point, that if the parameters are random-like, you can understand something about the properties of these models. So the property we are interested in here is why are neural nets reversible? And by reversible, I mean the phenomenon uh, that has been observed that a neural net, uh, which I'll define in, a, in the next slide, uh, but I'm sure most of you have seen some examples of neural nets, which are used for image classification. Turns out if you run it in reverse, you get some reasonably meaningful images. So that's what I uh, mean as reversible. Okay, I'll define that more. Okay, so neural nets. Uh, yeah, I think unless if you've been on another planet altogether, you've uh, you know from all the hype that uh, <laughs> neural nets are solving a lot of uh, important AI problems, including image recognition, uh, very, very well, better than human accuracy. And, uh, and so these are multi-layer networks. You, put, you input the data here, like images in this case, and the classification comes out at the other end. It's multi-layer and it's non-linear. And the basic uh, unit that's used in these networks is what's called the ReLU gate, rectify linear, uh, which is, you know, takes a, a bunch of uh, incoming uh, values, x1 through xn, weights them w through w1 through wm, uh, computes the, the sum, summation wi xi, and there's some threshold theta, and then applies the ReLU, and ReLU is this computation on a number, which is max of x and 0. Okay, it's a non, it's a non linear uh, uh, function. OK, so this gate uh, applies this function always. OK, so that's the gate used throughout. And there have been many, many variants of this basic idea in the last five years. And it's taken the world of machine learning by storm. OK, so, uh, so this is, of course, inspired very much by, uh, by uh, the biological analogy. I mean, the neurons in our brain behave Something like that, uh, and, uh, and hence these are called neural nets. But uh, so, if you want to uh, think of an intuitive way to say uh, to think about what I'm saying next, some people intuitively think of this as dreaming. Okay, what I'm going to say next: that the same network can also generate fairly realistic imagery. Okay, so you can think of it as dreaming. Okay, so. So the phenomenon is the following that 
given the vector at the, at the top layer, the neural net can be run in reverse to generate reasonable images. It's not true for all neural nets, but off, in many settings that you can train neural nets which, are, which have this property. Uh, there's something called the restricted Boltzmann machine of Hinton, uh, which defines some kind of a generator model, okay, which goes from one layer to the top and the, from top layer to the bottom. And uh, so if you give me the, the, so if you take an image and you input it here, this network will produce some representation, which only the neural network understands what that representation is. But now if you take that representation and put it in the, uh, in the top layer and feed it through, it generates some kind of distribution on images here. And these images may sometimes look a little fantastical, not quite this, you know, that's why it's dreaming, right? But they look sort of reasonable. Okay? So that's the phenomenon I'm talking about. That's what I mean by reversibility. This is a very crude uh, uh, way of thinking about it. Okay? So this is, uh, uh, as I said on a previous slide, there are actually more sophisticated ways these days people have of, of reversing this. Okay? It's not just running it in reverse. That's, that's a very crude way of doing it. But even that sort of works, as we'll see. Any questions so far? Uh, uh, it's not completely reversible, yeah. So what exactly that means is not clear, yeah. So it looks sort of reasonably okay. And actually in the version that I'll show, I mean, it's, uh, you'll see, it looks sort of like the original image, okay? So it, it is sort of roughly reversible. It's not exactly reversible, yeah. Okay, you're asking about the generator model. Uh, I'll describe ours later. I won't describe the RBM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is a single. So you're thinking of the, uh, you think of the this reverse network as some kind of a model that generates data. Take one of those samples that it generates. And that just, uh, so uh, notice that an image is just uh, uh, an array of numbers, right, uh, in the RGB space, right, each pixel. So it's, so it's outputting some array of numbers, you're interpreting it as an image. You know, just uh, the RGB values for the pixels. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's why uh, people refer to it as dreaming also sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. At the top. So, uh, so uh, you know, you can specify a distribution up there in the generator model that you train. But right now, I'm even thinking of, you know, take a real image pass it upwards, take the vector on the top, and reverse, yeah. And in general, yeah, according to the generator model, what you get, again, at the bottom may not be the original image, but something like that. Okay, so as an example, you know, at least on simple data sets like uh, images of numbers, uh, you train a machine like this, and you generate samples from that, uh, you know, by running it backwards, and you see things that look like numbers that people may have written. Okay, so that's what I mean by reversible. So th you can see that it's jagged and maybe not quite right. Maybe no human would ever write it like this, like this, but you know, they look kind of like numbers. Yeah. What's stable? Well, uh, stable meaning? Uh, you mean uh, up and then back again? Uh, it depends on the parameters, yeah. You can introduce a lot of noise, and so it depends on how you train this uh, distribution. You can train it to generate a lot of noise and even change it. It's not regurgitating the same image, it seems, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so here's the theory why this happens. And the, theory, the hypothesis is that in real life neural nets, that you actually fit through data or to images, the matrix defining each layer, so between each pair of uh, each pair of successive layers, is a matrix of numbers. Remember that 
between each pair of layers, there's, there are these edges, right, corresponding to those ReLU gates. And those edges have numbers, okay, weights. So that matrix, that bipartite matrix, behaves like a random matrix. So that's the hypothesis. Now, randomness in the eye of the beholder, right? What does random mean? What a random matrix means? I mean, some people look at singular values, et cetera. So, well, you, you check the singular values and they are pretty random, okay? They look like those of a random matrix, okay? The semicircle law. Um, so we call these random-like neural nets. Okay, so these are the singular values of a, of a layer and, and a three-layer, sorry, of the three layers, uh, of the three layers in a three-layer neural net trained on some image data. Okay, so the theorem is, it's not very hard, uh, is that such random-like nets are provably reversible. Okay, so I'll, uh, yeah. I see. So the question, the que yeah, I, I see where you're going. So the question was, is the number of hidden nodes the same as the number of uh, observed nodes? And that's a very relevant question because maybe the network is just memorizing, right? But, uh, uh, oh, sorry, not for this image, but, but for the reversibility. No, so you do have a bottleneck condition, what people say, that, that the layers on top are more sparse, meaning they, they have fewer non-zeros. So the network cannot just memorize. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I forget the, well, yeah, what, uh, yeah, I should look at the fine print. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so how, how does this work? Uh, whoa, okay, sorry. Uh, it didn't look so uh, 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 pixelated. Uh, I, I just uh, cut and pasted from the paper and it, it's very pixelated. Sorry. So, um, in the small screen, doesn't look so pixelated. Um, so, okay, so what's a feed-forward net? The, the, the input is given here, like the image or whatever. And uh, it's applying this, uh, each layer is applying this function, you know, ReLU, coordinate-wise ReLU, uh, rectify linear, on some matrix, weight matrix times this vector, plus some threshold, and applying coordinate-wise rectify linear, and just each layer is doing something similar. So that's the forward net. Right, what we normally think of as neural nets. And now this is the reverse, the dreaming net, which is a generator model. And this is just run in reverse, okay? So you, uh, you take the top layer and apply the same matrix, the transpose of that matrix on that. And then you are allowed to do some sampling, actually, okay? So to add some noise. So it's, uh, you, you mask out some, uh, some of the non-zeros and replace them with zeros. That's the generator model. And we call that the shadow distribution, okay? That, you just train the neural net, uh, possibly with a very small tweak in the usual training method. And automatically, with no change, you just get this twin generator model, okay, which we call the shadow distribution. So this, this reverse direction is a generator model that uh, gives a distribution on this layer given a value of that layer. Okay? So if you, if you compose, you given a uh, value for the top layer, you get a distribution of values over here. And the theorem says that uh, this forward direction provably performs approximate map inference of that layer given the bottom layer, okay? So this generator model for generating inputs has a property that the forward net is just performing approximate inference for the top layers given this. Okay, and that's provably so. Okay, if the if the net is uh, if the net is random like, yeah. Oh, so it's it's only a constant factor. So you know you get like 80, 90 percent of the coordinates correct, roughly correct. It's not 100 percent correct. It's approximate. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, L1 error. Okay, so again, this is highly pixelated. But this actually is because the CIFAR data set, for those of you who played, played with, is very low resolution. So there's a standard uh, data set that's a horse, and uh, this is too pixelated. If you sort of squint at it, you'll see it looks kind of like a horse. Okay, these images, so, these are so that's what it looks like. Okay, so it's, the model generates these images, 
which are kind of like the original image, but not quite the same. Okay, so that's the reverse. Yeah, if you squint at it, or, or you see it on a small screen, it does look like a. Uh, an L1 error is it, yeah. The, the theorem says L1 error is, is closed. Yeah. Okay, so uh, proof idea. So again, this, will, uh, this goes back to the theme of regression that I introduced in the first uh, vignette. So it's basically just nonlinear regression, okay? So uh, this is reminiscent, if you know this, of one-bit compressed sensing. Uh, and something called heavy hitters hash from the theory community, if you if you remember that. So the idea is that nature picks a k-sparse vector x, and uh, and you're presented a, a vector y, which is ReLU of ax plus theta, okay, for some theta, and and a is some matrix, okay, and some coordinates are randomly zero or odd. This is the masking noise. Okay, so then the theorem is, and this is the precise theorem, that without, with high probability of the choice of A, uh, for most X's, it'll be that X is equal to ReLU of A transpose Y plus theta. So it's reversible. Okay, and that's, uh, the main idea is that yeah, if you didn't have the noise and the ReLUs and nonlinearity and so on, uh, this would be fairly straightforward from the fact that for a random matrix, A transpose A is identity. So A transpose does reverse A. But now you have nonlinearities and noise, and it still holds. Okay, that the A transpose reverses. That's the idea. Okay, so it's some uh, new form of uh, regression in the presence of nonlinearities and, and noise. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in in a situation where you have a, a lot of input, like the pixels on an image, but a small output, like a classification. Oh, and then it, you then can reverse. It doesn't behave anywhere like this. No, right? this is actually the last but one layer. What, what I showed you, the horse, yeah. that was from the last but one. You know, not the final. In C410, you only have 10 categories, so that's too little information to recover. But the last but one image, uh, the la last but one layer, which is used to produce that final output, that How it's a horse. Just the uh, 100 or 200, something like that. But the number of non zeros is pretty small, yeah, maybe 50, 60. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Excellent question. Yeah. I let, I have the next slide. Any other question before I go to that? Okay. So what uses this? Oops. I already did this. What what happened here? Okay. Implications for training. Okay. So uh, so we have the shadow distribution, right? So you can, you can improve the training a little bit. So what you do is, as you're training, so this is for people who maybe train neural nets. As you're training, uh, you, you're working with a bunch of images that, for which you have labels. Using this, what does this say? You, know, you take an image, and, and say the net is random-like currently, okay? So we assume the re net stays random-like. Take an image that you've got, whose label you're given, Send it through the net. You get a vector for uh, a vector at the top layer. You know what its label is, right? Because you have the label for the image. Use that to generate a new image, which will have the same same label. Add that new artificial image to your data set. Okay. We call that the shadow regularizer. Is this clear? I'll say it again. You have a bunch of labeled images. You're training a neural net. At every step, it seems like the neural net is pretty random-like. So what you do is you take labeled images, feed them through the net, get the vector at the top layer, reverse to get a new image, which should have the same label, right, according to the theory, and add that new labeled artificial image to your data set. Yeah. OK. OK. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to put it, yeah. OK, yes, yes. So, uh, so OK, so compressed sensing doesn't do it for ReLU, as far as I know, and with the masking noise, yeah. But I should convert it to ReLU yes. and recover. 
Sorry? It's fairly close to compress sensing. If I could throw in random theta in and raise it and, and put it out there, yeah. I should be able to solve the problem for y itself because I can pass y plus theta to the right. That's what this is showing, yeah. You have to prove that it works, yeah. Okay, but it should, there should be some condition on this part. Yes, yes, there is, yeah. Okay. yeah. So under those conditions. Yeah. Fine, sorry. Yeah. But the important thing is normally with A transpose kind of uh, compress sensing, you know, because they're interested in worst case kind of settings, right? X is or Y is worst case. They only go up to spot CD square root n, but this actually goes to linear. And that's important, yeah. Because you only want the good probability inverse, not for all X's. So that's one difference. Yeah. So I, I don't have an analog of the RIP property here or anything, yeah. So you just do barehanded calculation about random matrices and and actually, the matrices you get do actually allow such an inverse. OK, so anyway, so that was the, the training. And, and yeah, it does improve the training a little bit. Uh, uh, so this is our, OK, sorry. This is our, so this was backprop plane. This is backprop plus shadow, which is a few percent better. And this shows that the error on the synthetic data. Remember the synthetic images you produce? On the other area, it's a little bit, small, a little bit uh, smaller, which means that there's this, uh, this really is like a regularizer, for those of you who understand regularizers. Yeah? Can you compare this more to the powder magnetization method? No, we haven't compared that. Yeah, I agree that you can get similar kinds of improvements by other means. And so what you would like to do is put this on top of all the other things that people have know how to soup up neural nets and see if this still implies. But the main point of this is that you know the theory works, the nets are reversible, and yeah. Okay, and also is open or open is to ex extension to convolution neural nets. I mean, there is an idea that we tried, but uh, it didn't give much improvement for convolution neural nets. Okay, so uh, the last part is uh, semantic word embeddings, and. Uh, um, uh, so uh, they have, OK, what are semantic word embeddings? I'll, I'll describe that. And by the way, this is joint work with Yuanji Li, Ying Yu Liang, Teng Yuma, and Andre Rysteski. OK, so what are semantic word embeddings? So this goes to uh, some of the uh, goals of artificial intelligence that people have had for, uh, for many decades, you know, Turing test and all that. What is meaning? How do you test some, whether the computer has an understanding of meaning, et cetera? So one simple way that uh, people, uh, one simple task that people identified was to solve analogies, for instance. So man is to woman as king is to. Uh, so you know, can a computer solve such analogies? Now, notice that the computer may not be given any examples of analogies. Okay? It's just given a text corpus. And it reads this, you know, Wikipedia, it reads these a lot and processes it in some way. And then somehow it should be able to solve analogies. OK, that's the whole. Uh, or you could think about knowledge augmentation. If you give a human this sequence, Japan, Tokyo, China, Beijing, Germany, Berlin, any human sh uh, should be able to give more examples of this. Can a human do that? Can a computer do that? OK? And again, the computer is just given these three examples and a huge corpus. OK, so somehow it has to figure out what this pattern is. OK, so it's sort of like, again, analogies. OK, so word embeddings are useful for these and many other tasks, uh, like machine translation, answering questions, the image labeling, et cetera. So, uh, so what are word embeddings? They are vectors, OK, which capture meanings of words. I'll, I'll describe more. So how, how are word embeddings constructed? OK, how do you capture meaning? So here's a simple question for you. Think of a word that co-occurs with cow, drink, babies, and calcium. Milk. Somebody else had something else. Bottle. Bottle. OK, yeah. <laughs> milk, OK. The majority answer was milk. OK. So uh, all right, so, uh, so how did you know this, right? I just asked you what word occurs with these things, right? So that's uh, the distributional hypothesis of meaning. This comes from linguistics, Harris and Firth in the 1950s. That the meaning of a word is determined by the words it co-occurs with. If I tell you, you know, the distribution of all other words that it occurs with in, in a normal corpus, you would have pinned down the meaning. 
Okay? This is somewhat controversial. You know, in linguistics, people don't believe this is, they believe it's sort of true, mostly true, but it's not 100%. And you can come with counterexamples. Yeah. Um, what does co-occur with in the sense? Uh, like, of okay, co-occur like within uh, distance pi of, distance. of the world. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there are various uh, parameters you can tweak in this training. Okay, so word embeddings are low-dimensional vectors that that capture co-occurrence statistics. Okay, and I'll describe the simplest ways of doing this. So anyway, they're low-dimensional vectors that capture these co-occurrence statistics, and then they can be used to solve some of the tasks I talked about, like analogies and extending knowledge bases and so on. Okay, so word embeddings, uh, some properties that they have is, uh, many of them have the property that cosine similarity, so just the cosine of the angle between the embeddings of two words captures uh, or correlates with human notions of similarity. So if you ask humans, 20 humans, to rate the similarity of words, and then you, you check against word embeddings that, are, uh, derived, that people come up with, the cosine of the angle tends to correlate with that similarity, okay, human rating the similarity. And the second is that analogies can be solved by linear algebra. This was a new discovery only a few years ago. So for these fancy word embeddings that people have come up with lately, uh, if you want to solve an analogy, man is to woman as king is to, you take the vector for man and the vector for woman, take the difference, take the vector for king, and now look for a word such that you minimize, you know, th this difference is as close to this as possible, okay? And over all 100,000 words in the dictionary, that word, which is close, if says that this vector is closest, happens to be queen. Okay? And on some simple uh, test bed of analogies, actually this method solves about 80% of analogies. Okay? On more complicated test, test beds, it's a little bit uh, not as good, maybe 20%, 25%. But even that's very good, right? Because there are 100,000 words. So there are 100,000 possible answers. And the method comes up with the best one. Yeah. Yeah, I'll describe it in the next slide. Yeah, any other questions? Not too large, a few million, yeah. Okay, that's actually a very good question. So how large a corporate does it need to be? How large, how well-read should a computer be before it understands, <laughs> right? And uh, actually people have done some, argue, uh, some calculations and convincingly argued that it has a pretty good idea after it has been exposed to as much as, uh, I don't know, uh, 12 year old kid or whatever, right? Yeah, something like that. But uh, it's, it, it, yeah, yeah the, I think the, but of course, uh, computers are free to use as much as they like. Okay, so, uh, uh, so why do lower dimensional embeddings exist? That's the first question, okay? So uh, remember, we're trying to understand properties of these machine learning models. So why do lower dimensional embeddings, word embeddings exist? Uh, and I, you know, I asked the, Experts who sort of just specialize in experimental methods for driving word embeddings, and they say, what do you mean, why do they exist? You know, you compute the thing and it exists. What do you mean? So let me formulate it mathematically. So here's a very simple word embedding method, which actually does reasonably well and goes back to 1990, which is the PMI method. So for any pair of words, WW prime, you compute this very nonlinear measure. It's a measure of correlation. So you take the joint probability of W and W prime, the probability they occur close to each other in the corpus, PWW prime, joint probability, divide by the product of the probabilities, and take the log. Okay, so it's a fairly nonlinear measure. That's called PMI. So now you comp uh, for all pairs of words, you put this, compute this PMI measure, that's your matrix. Okay, this is actually a fairly sparse matrix, but because not all words co-occur with all, not all pairs of words co-occur. That's called the PMI matrix. Okay, now each row of this is capturing, so each of these is a co uh, some kind of a correlation measure, right, for W and W prime. So if you look at each row, it's saying for each word, for this word W, what is its correlation with all the other words, okay? So that's some kind of a semantic vector already, right? But it's a very long vector because its dimensionality is the size of the dictionary, 100,000. So it turns out that if you just do a 300 rank approximation via singular value decomposition of this matrix, that gives you just as good embeddings, actually better embeddings. Okay, so low dimension, going to lower dimension actually cleans up the embedding. Okay, and so the question, to formalize that question is, what property of language, so this works for English, Russian, whatever, what property of language causes this large matrix to have this approximate rank 300. 
right? So you compute this PMI measure for words, and then it has approximately the order y. So that's the formalization of that question. Uh, and as uh, and you already saw earlier in the first vignette, uh, there was uh, we're working with linear models for the co-occurrence probabilities of words, and that's actually very related to topic models. But here we have a very non-linear uh, measure. Yeah. Probability that they occur within, say, distance phi over each other. Number of times, yeah. Five, ten, yeah, it's not so sensitive, yeah. Excellent, you know, that's part of this question, right? What, what, what's the property of language that, so, okay, so clearly log is not so different from power one-third, right, or one-fourth for a reasonable value. So, yes, indeed, those also work. And, you know, people would de debate, somebody would say, I think one third is the right number, and some people say log, you know. And uh, so I'll present some uh, theory that I think supports log. But again, empirically, you can't distinguish log from power one third for these numbers. Okay, so uh, how do word embeddings, uh, so there is a second question, okay? So how do word embeddings reflect polysemy? So for each word, you have one vector, which captures this meaning, but what does that mean? Because words have multiple meanings. Tie can mean an article of clothing, physical act, drawn match. Uh, so how does this word vector reflect those different meanings? Okay, so we'll answer that too with our theory. And, uh, and again, we'll verify the answer. And the third one is the one I already mentioned, the solving analogies by linear uh, algebra. Why do relations correspond to directions? Okay, this masculine feminine relation corresponds to some direction. So, so there were some uh, earlier attempted explanations. They were not theoretical explanations, but uh, there were some intuitive explanations which we do borrow from. Okay, but these empirical models don't actually explain the structure because, yeah, I, won't, I don't want to go into that. Okay, so it's in the paper why it's, th there's something missing from the explanation. Okay, so that's the first question. Why do low dimensional vectors capture the essence of large co statistics? So what we do is we do this, uh, give this generative model for language with semantics, and this is different from topic models. Okay, it's sort of reminiscent of topic models, but it has a logarithm in it, which actually was known even before our work to actually result in more faithful uh, models. So, Corpus generation is via random walk in a discourse space. Discourse as in what's being talked about. So if you think about Wikipedia as one very large document, as you go from left to right, what's being talked about moves around, okay? So we're thinking of that as a, as a random walk in a discourse space, say, which is a 300-dimensional cube. And discourse vector is uh, what's being talked about. It's uh, where the coordinates have some semantic meaning, like. It could be about gender, age, whatever. So what we thought of earlier as topics, those correspond to coordinates here. Uh, each word also has a representation as a vector in this space. And if the discourse vector at time t is ct, then the probability that the word is output is proportional to the exponential of the inner product of bw and ct. Okay, so this is what's called a log linear topic model by Ni and Hinton. Hinton is uh, a pioneer in neural nets. And this does come out of uh, neural nets work, actually, this kind of log linear models. Okay, so just to illustrate, uh, uh, my postdoc Yingyu uh, took an actual paragraph. He took a fitted model and took an actual paragraph and inferred using probabilistic means the random walk that was generating this, this paragraph. Okay, just all this figure is showing you is a, is a random walk. Okay, nothing profound here. Uh, people often wonder how we infer the random walk, and uh, I won't go into that. Okay. So the key modeling assumption for our theory, so there's the random walk assumption, okay? We, uh, and the second is uh, isotropy, that the set of these word vectors, the sort of ground truth meanings, is spatially isotropic, okay? So uniformly, roughly uniformly distributed in this space. Uh, so in the bulk, they behave like a set of random vectors, okay? So again, this goes back to the universality phenomenon. And concretely, we can think in the calculations that behave uh, like S times some unit Gaussian, uh, but, uh, but actually, we just need some properties, which I won't talk about, something like you can think of it as condition number, but not quite. Uh, and that's all we need, and that actually is, it holds. Okay. So it turns out that for most uh, directions, this so-called partition function is constant. Okay, that's what we need. It's like a condition number. And this turns out is empirically true. Okay, it's highly concentrated. And so then, if you have this, so the, the discourse vector is doing a random walk, and the word vectors are spatially isotropic, 
what does this model generate? Okay, what distribution on words? And it actually fits the end predicts that have been observed, namely that uh, the log of the uh, joint probabilities is vw plus vw prime square, and lo the log probability is vw square, and the PMI is the inner product. Okay, this is the 25-year-old uh, model. This uh, that was empirically discovered, uh, and this model actually fits that. Okay, so the, the basic story is that the norm of the word vector determines its frequency, okay, the log of the probability, and the spatial orientation which determines inner products determines its meaning because how, it determines how often it co occurs with other words. Okay, so that's a theory. Uh, the fit of these things is reasonably good. This one fits within 5% error on a weighted, I won't describe what 5% means, it's in the paper. And this is not quite as good. So that actually that model is better. Okay, and uh, turns out it, for their calculations using this model explains recent methods that use recurrent neural nets, matrix factorization, etc. Okay, so this is sort of a theoretical explanation for these empirically derived methods. So the second question I wanted to that the theory address is, uh, you know, how does the word vector contain the various meanings, okay, of the word? And uh, so there's polysemy that uh, Thai can mean multiple things. And uh, I guess I'm out of time, but I'll just uh, finish this uh, thought. So, so there's a cool, I'll first describe the cool experiment, okay, which apparently nobody had done before. And, and our theory predicted which way it'd come out, and actually it does come out that way, okay? So, the, uh, so, uh, so let's do the following thought experiment. So let's think of Thai as really two, let's say it has two meanings. It's really two different words, Thai 1 and Thai 2, which happen to be both represented the same way in English, Thai. So now a crude model for how this could happen, which is again not linguistically correct, is that uh, two unrelated words were combined into one word, and uh, all occurrences of the two words are now replaced by Thai. Okay, so that's a quick experiment. Take two random unrelated words, W1 and W2, where one is much more frequent than two, than the other which is an important feature of polysemy, that not all meanings are the same, uh, have the same frequency. So they have very different frequencies. And declare these two to be a single word and replace every occurrence of W1 and W2 in the corpus with this new word, W. And now compute the embedding of W, okay? So the question is, how is, how does this, how does the embedding of this new word relate to the embeddings of W1 and W2? Suggestions. Weighted sum. Good. It is like weighted sum. But what are the coefficients? So it's a linear superposition of the two vectors, approximately. What are the coefficients? It's not 1 and 100. Good. So it's not a 100. It's a log. OK? And, and, and so it is something like this. And this is mathematically explainable in our model. If you assume that the model fit was like we, the inner product is PMI plus Gaussian noise. Um, again, the Gaussian noise assumption can be weakened, okay? It's some random like uh, noise. And this seems very relevant. You know, if you think about even neural, we have been actually working with neuroscientists and, uh, on this model and, you know, understanding fMRI uh, data. And it makes sense that, you know, brain uh, takes logarithm of all kinds of stimuli, right? Uh, uh, auditory, visual, and represents them internally using the logarithm. And meaning also has high dynamic range. And so it makes sense that the representation of meaning should involve a logarithm. Okay? And, so, and it's actually a linear term. So actually, uh, uh, it turns out then, if you think further, you, can re you realize that if you want to recover those component meanings, they must correspond to two different representative discourses, right? So that tie one and tie two will occur. One will occur in clothing discourse and the other in tying up people together or things together. So there are two dis different discourses, and turns out there's a trick called sparse coding, so linear algebraic uh, procedure, which take, which finds some discourses, say about 2,000, 3,000, says that every word vector order for the dictionary, uh, all, all of these can be represented as weighted sum of at most five of them. So five is the number of nominal number of meanings per word, okay, that this method allows, and it works beautifully. And so, for instance, these are the some some of this discourses that you find. So these are things that people talk about in Wikipedia. Uh, this is ways in which you can die. These are social media. Uh, this is horse racing. I didn't know many of these words myself, you know. And I had to look it up and realize that this is actually very coherent. 
horse racing. Uh, this is cell biology, things, you know, classical music, et cetera. So, and, and then if you want to know how, what are the meanings of tie, you look at, you know, express it with phi, as a sparse combination of these meanings. By the way, these meanings are represented using the nearest words. Uh, the atoms, are, you know, this is the clothing atom. This is, you know, games and seasons and so on. And uh, very related, you know, tied game, score line, equalizer, clinching, et cetera. Tying up wires and so on. And this one seems to be junk. Although people who know opera say tie is a word in opera. So maybe it's not junk, but probably it is junk. And, uh, you know, out of five, you, you are lucky if you get three or four correct. That's about, you know, we have some... Uh, some numerical data suggesting that it's about three to four meanings you get. Okay, this I won't say, that, but the theory also uh, has a good explanation for why um, relations correspond to directions. And one thing it explains, for which I didn't know any explanation, was this old observation which, which I mentioned, that you take the word in vectors, and if you do dimensional reduction, like take low dimensional vectors, those are actually better. Okay, and the theory actually explains that as well. But I, I'm out of time, so I won't uh, describe that. But there is some kind of a purification effect, again, using the fact that these word vectors are kind of random-like in space. And which actually is an assumption that seems very surprising to my linguist friends, NLP friends, that these word vectors are so isotropic in space. OK, uh, so conclusion. Uh, to understand complex and non-convex machine learning models, uh, you need to make simplifying assumptions that can enable design of provable algorithms of provable, provide new insight. And this uh, random-like matrix or random-like parameters uh, seems to help that. Okay. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.